Hi, David Weinzard here, and you are watching Paratech 10. Our sole intent at Paratech 10 is to convey usable tech that's useful to both the professionals and amateurs. I, I use the word amateurs, there. I always wince when I say amateurs. I should say those people who don't do it for a living but can be equally as good as many professionals. In this Paratech 10 episode, whatever goes by over there, we are going to deal with the next part of Mission Impossible. That's Uncle Tony's project. I'm still on this lightning binge and you may wonder why take my glasses off here. You may wonder why I'm spending so much time emphasizing this business about lightness. Well, mass is the enemy of every race car. It is the enemy of every high performance car. So we may as well start at the beginning and lose mass because it never helps to have mass unless a breakage looms. We don't have any perception of a breakage being on the horizon. So that's our goal there. We are going to replace old school stuff with new school stuff that is not expensive. So I'm going to go into a few details here. Parts you can buy or parts we're going to use on this initial build that are good no, I should say that are not only good, but great value for money. So let's get going on that. Here's the rod, almost finished. Right, I've still got this to do round here. And I'm going to replace these nuts here with some 12 point ARP nuts, which are about 60% of the weight of these. So I think we save uh, about six grams per nut, right, on that. So we've still got a, a 12 grams to come off there. And when I've milled around here and put the chamfer on on both sides, that will save us about another 12 grams. Right, so here's our rod. Now, I have to say that so many people said I need to shot peen these. Hadn't intended on doing that, but from popular demand, I am going to get the rods shot peened. So that shiny finish that you see on there will, after it's shot peened, make the rod look like it's a fully machined aftermarket rod. As for the weight, well, that's still secret. Don't forget, February the 1st is coming up for, for awarding a book prize to whoever got the nearest reduction in weight at that point that I said. Anyway, on with the plot. Here's the stock valve. 118 grams. Here's our LS valve. Remember I showed you the size difference before? Right? 90 grams. Here's our LS valve prepped. This one, after having the face machined here, and I've made it an anti-reversionary form, not drastically so, but I'll show you that when we do the cylinder head stuff. And the back of the valve, right, it's all blended into the seat. I have not, this is a rough cut seat. Um, I didn't bother to finish cut the seat because I'm in there with a the grinder doing the back face. Stock LS valve, 90 grams. Modified one. 87 grams. We're getting lighter all the time.
Losing mass at the valve train is really important and it becomes even more important for what we're doing and that is we're trying to make 300 horsepower or 318 through a carburetor which is way too small. Now you might say well the cylinder head's not going to matter that's going to be the restriction but that's not quite the case. The carburetor has pressure recovery which most restrictive deals don't have. Now here's what happens when that cylinder starts to draw it needs to have as free of flowing situation as possible right away because we don't want to have a pressure drop across the valve of any great extent we want the pressure drop to happen between the piston and the carburetor right now remember we've got 256 cfm at 28 inches what if we can create more inches of pressure drop at the carburetor by having a super efficient valve so that now our carburetor will flow more air into the system, right? So in other words, we do not want to lose cylinder suction across the intake valve. We want to lose, we want to expend that ability to suck on the carburetor not on the valve and carburetor. So we've got to have a fast opening valve and an efficient flowing valve at low lift. What have we got here? LS valve, stock Chrysler valve. Now look, there's the difference in size. Can you see that? Should be able to, right? Now let's look at the difference in weight. Stock Chrysler valve. Look at this, 118.6 grams. That's a heavy dude, right? Stock LS valve, 90.3 grams. That's 25% lighter for a valve, which is also about 10% bigger diameter. That's why I'm anxious to use these valves, even though it's a super budget build. Now, I got a set of these valves for next to nothing because they're used. LS valves don't seem to wear very much, even if the oil changes aren't really good. Uh, this one here's done about 150,000 miles and is showing virtually zero wear. By the time I've cleaned this one up and there's a bit of lightning possible here and I'm going to make it slightly anti-reversion in here. It will be a very good valve for what we're going to do. Well, the next thing to take care of is the valve spring. Here I've got some good news. Usually, if it's good, it costs a lot of money. If it's cheap, it doesn't work very well. Here's the exception. This is a spring that I've used a lot of and over a long time. This spring has been around a long time and I've never seen a broken one. Now, this is a Howard's spring and you can get a really good deal on them from Summit for 46 bucks a set. Now, here's the good thing about it. It is made of good wire and it is small in diameter. The smaller the diameter is, the more uh, it makes it the valve stiff because each coil is actually a little torsion bar. So if you make the spring smaller, the spring has to twist more like this as it compresses. So, so long as the material is not overstressed, by making it too small, we have a spring which is very efficient. By efficiency, I'm talking about the higher its resonant frequency is, the more the spring puts its effort into the valve train mass and less of the spring is needed to control its own mass. This spring is worth twice the money you'll pay for it. You've got to get this from Summit you'll pay half the price you will for a typical spring of this 
performance capability. And it will not only deal with what we're doing here, but it will deal with quite a bit more of RPM and performance than we're doing here. So this, this is why I use a lot of these springs. Now, a friend of mine who is an incredible late model stalker build where he has to comp his engines have to compete with crate motors, right? He wins championships all over the place. And he's come up with a novel idea with that spring. He puts this, he makes his own damper up like this. And this, this makes this spring even better because when it starts to wobble that way, this inner spring damper controls it so that it goes up and down nice and clean and this gives very good control on the way up to valve float now it's critical to get the uh fit just right in there to, for it to do this job and i'm not going to tell you what that fit is because you'll need to get the spring from him if you want to set like this now then that mod makes it not such a cheap spring but the point is this it's already underpriced by such a large amount that this mod plus that spring still makes it a bargain the, the, the name of the business coming up right so just take that as a note now if we want the ultimate spring beehive but unfortunately beehive springs are expensive now, this spring here is 82 grams this one here, this beehive spring here, is 70 grams. Now I want you to consider this. This part of the spring, which is the part that does the most motion, is much smaller than this. So although the spring's 70 grams, it acts like one of only about 60 grams. And they are nearly unfloatable. Now, to get these you've normally got to pay somewhere around about 130 bucks a set right however i'm researching a spring now that is going to be probably half that price so i'll let you know whether it's any good or not in a few editions time if it's good at the price i'm seeing for it this could well be the spring we'll go for which means that we'll have a valve train that's going to be able to turn probably 8,000 RPM with spring loads that are consistent with only stock valve springs. That's going to be good for anti-wear properties for our flat tappet cam. Well, so much for valves and springs. Now let's look at retainers and see where we might lose some mass there. Here's a sample of some of the retainers that we could be using with our uh, valve spring. That's this valve spring, our very inexpensive Howard spring, or a beehive spring, assuming that I can get one at the price that we can all agree is a bargain. Now let's start off with this retainer here. This is the stock retainer. Nothing fancy about it, a regular seven degree retainer, and it weighs in at 24.9 grams. Let's say 25, right? Now I've got these in order of weight. So here's the next one. This one weighs in at 20. This one here weighs in at 19.7. Steel, steel, steel. Titanium. This one weighs in at 13.6. Steel beehive retainer, 11.7. So this is a stock factory retainer for an LS motor, right, which we can use with our LS springs. So super light, and it's just as cheap as dirt, right? Next one here, our first aluminum one. 
9.1. Our next aluminum one, see it's got these dimples in it here, right? And it's got a slot in the back side there, right? This has remained thick so that it works as a burst ring here. 8.5. Now our super light retainer with the same burst ring and all that, but all these taken through. 6.3 titanium one. 7.9 for a beehive. Now this one is as strong as this original steel one. No lightning done on it. You'll notice that it's almost as light as this aluminum one here which will not stand a lot of abuse and would only be able to make a few passes of the drag strip. Right, so we can see the advantage here of using the beehive spring because not only do we have a super light spring, but we'll compare it with that, right, but also we get to use it with a super light retainer. Now look, see what that is there? 90 say 78 grams now let's weigh this one with its steel retainer 107 now does there look like there is a weight difference there but let's say we can engineer s some titanium retainers out of some old used ones right now there's we'd be 95.8, that's compared with 78, right? So the, obviously the beehive is the one to go with. And because it's got such a high resonant frequency, just before the end of its lift, it's over 100,000 cycles per minute. That is super high. You can't get that out of a spring like this right about the highest you can get a decent spring like this parallel spring is around about 32,000 cycles a minute that's it so now you can see why the beehive spring ultimately if the price is right would be our choice if you'd like to know why beehive and conical springs are so much more advanced than regular parallel wham springs then just go and check out episode 25 i guarantee it will tell you more on this subject than any other internet video now as i said because these coils up here are smaller and and are the ones that take the most motion this spring acts like it would act like it's 67 grams Now let's see what we can do with what we've got in a box of retainers here. Right, so let's move all these out of the way and grab my box of odd retainers. Look, all of them titanium. Got all those there, all titanium. All I've got to do is find 16 that I can make work. 16, how many have we got? Four, nine, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Look at that, just enough. So we're gonna look. I'm gonna look at making some titanium retainers for this type of spring here. Right. So we'll see how we get on with that. That's about it for Paratech Ten, Episode Seventy Five, Part Six of Mission Impossible. And don't forget, this is a project that we are going to be either auctioning the engine off or raffling it off for the benefit of St. Jude's. So, please, to help get the audience for this, please subscribe and like. You'll be helping some kid survive. So it doesn't take much effort on your part to just do it. Thank you for watching.